So I guess we just, everybody here is here to see my talk, right? Okay, welcome. Anyway, um, thank you for turning up. I have to say, this is all slightly weird to me, the idea of we actually in the same room and we're not in this little box trying to manage things there, so it's, it's all a bit of a novelty. Anyway, um, this is a 20 minute session, so the pace has to be pretty high. Um, this is normally an hour session, we get to do demos and things like that, but in this case we just haven't got the time to go deeper to demos, which is a real shame because I love a good demo. Um, I will try and bring a demo into here if I'm willing to tempt the demo gods. I don't know whether anybody here has brought a laptop with them. Has somebody brought a laptop? Do we have a volunteer with a laptop? I'll need you later, so I just thought I'd ask this laptop. <laughs> I, did, I did bring one in, actually. Uh, okay. That's all right. So, anyway, um, on with the show. So, um, I, I'm a bit of a piss taker. I like to make things fun. So, I've tried to make the topic of security and compliance a bit more fun, because, let's face it, it's not the... It's, it's a dry topic, and if you make it fun, people tend to stick in your head. In 20 minutes, I'm not going to be able to impart every piece of knowledge in there, nor should I. What I'm trying to do is make you think about it and just provoke some thought. So, if my clicker... Oh, come on. The demo gods are not being kind to my clicker now. <laughs> yeah, no, literally, it worked. It's probably more of a slip now. Bear with me. So, on to the next. Okay. It's definitely frozen, isn't it? The mouse is here. So, I should be able to. You might have to use the keyboard. I might have to use the keyboard. To find out which area. The problem with these things, uh, we'll have to go back to this way. Right, okay. So, who am I? Um, my name is Dylan Hayes. I am employed as a Microsoft 365 consultant for a company called Blacklight Software. We're up in the wilds of Leeds and Southport. That's my cover story. In this here, I'm going to go into my alternative persona where actually I am an evil supervillain and my intent is world domination. And I'm going to show you how Microsoft 365 can help me with my evil plans for total world domination. Just the same as everybody else, I'm interested in world domination. I'm just a bit more honest about it. So um, there's me on LinkedIn, there's me running up a hill, which I'm actually doing tomorrow. For some strange reason, I've decided that I'm going to run up a mountain tomorrow. Uh, and I'm going to do it three times. Um, because once just isn't enough. So that's a bit about me. You can zap the QR code. So um, obviously we have to thank the generous support of the sponsors who make all this sort of thing happen and give us all the food that we've consumed and all those things. So we'll just pass through here. All these people that make it happen. So I'd like to start with a quote. Now, um, can anybody guess who said that? Oh, Boris Johnson. It wasn't Boris Johnson, but it possibly would have been. It was never an official quote, but apparently that was Peter Thiel said that he'd rather be considered to be um, evil than incompetent. And I think that's a brilliant um, summary of an attitude towards life, anyway. I'm not ad actually advocating you other evil, but if you're going to be evil, then you at least want to be evil competent rather than evil incompetent, because all these films are full of evil incompetent people. We don't want to be like them. So, moving on now. Sorry, I keep losing my mouse. This is actually evil incompetent, isn't it? So, again, this fictitious organisation I'm talking about, we're bent on world domination, just the same as everybody else, or at least we admit it. The way we work is we need to share information across the organisation, very much the same as anybody else. We want to store sensitive information and we want to share information with suppliers. Obviously, if you're bent on world domination, you have to procure missiles, nerve gas, all that sort of thing, and mini submarines and golf carts for your hollowed out volcano, and hire a contractor for building space stations and all those sort of things. So much the same problems as any large multinational. And obviously we need to collaborate with other organizations who are also interested in world domination. So we have the same problems as everybody else. It's, the problem is the internet has an original sin. And the original sin of the internet 
is that basically a bunch of hippies working late at night for defense companies came up with the idea of, it, of the internet. And they believed in peace and love, even though they worked for Lockheed Martin and companies like that. But they believed in peace and love and everybody should be able to share information. And the problem is the internet is fundamentally broken from birth. So the idea of the internet is that information can go everywhere at once. Information wants to be free. Now, obviously, in a corporate setting, especially when you're an evil um, organization, you really don't want the information to be free. You want information to be as tightly controlled as your hands around the neck of um, James Bond. You really do want that degree of control. So fundamentally, we've got a problem with the internet. The internet is just not for, fit for purpose. So all of the things we've done since then have been to un unbreak the internet as far as we're concerned, to make it more limiting in what you can do. So I talk about some guiding principles that every organization should have. A really important one, and people forget this, is you simply can't lose what you don't have. So why have a piece of information if that piece of information is dangerous to you and danger more dangerous to your enemies? You know, why store things? So think of an evil super villain. Why store the plans to your heating and vacuum? Why store the plans to your um, air conditioning system with a secret vent that nobody knows about? Why have that? Because if you lose that, that information is dangerous in the hands of your enemy. It's no good to you. So just think about what you're storing. You really don't need to store everything. I know there's this idea that we, oh, information is power, but sometimes not having information is power because if you haven't got that piece of information and you're not legally applied, obliged to keep it, then why? Just get rid of it. Um, the other thing, obviously this is particularly important if you're an evil supervillain, but I think everybody else should work on the same assumption, is trust no one. Assume that the people inside your organisation are, um, well, evil, kind of with our organisation everybody is evil, but assume that everybody inside your organisation is out to cause trouble. Um, trust people as little as possible, because most of the time data breaches are insiders. It's an insider that breaches the data, so give people only the minimum amount of information they need to do their jobs. Obviously, you can take that to a ridiculous degree, but quite often people over-provision information. Um, you think about it in the news at the moment, you've got the Pandora Papers. Somebody somewhere must have had far more access than they needed to do, unless that was done by a government. Then somebody somewhere obviously had access way inappropriate to their job. Security and collaboration, they're two sides, they're in balance with each other. If you increase security, you remove collaboration. If you remove collaboration, you, it works both ways. The US had the same problem where prior to 9-11, they were quite secure, but they didn't collaborate, so they didn't see 9-11 coming. Then after that, after WikiLeaks, I'd imagine they've gone the other way, where suddenly all this information they made easy to disseminate around the organization got disseminated outside the organization. Since then, they've gone in the direction of making it more secure, but less collaborative. So the two things are in balance. You can't actually have two perfectly done. You just have to decide what's appropriate to your organization. And lastly, this is an important point that a lot of people miss, is if you make it bloody impossible to use your systems, then somebody will find another way. Um, all of us across the pandemic, probably, I bet you everybody here works for a company where there is a WhatsApp group in that company where people share information. And shadow IT exists, it's a threat to you, and it happens. So if you provide good tools to collaborate within the company, this sort of thing is far less happy, far less likely to happen. If you don't provide these tools, people will think of other ways. People will copy things onto USB drives, people will use Dropbox, people will use all those things. You can stamp down on them, but ultimately people are trying to just do their bloody jobs. And so they will find a way because ultimately they're incentivized on the basis of how well they do their job. So if you make it hard for somebody to do their job, somebody will find another way of doing that. So you've always got to balance that with security. So I'd like to just say the first thing is everybody here thinks they use MFA, right? Everybody here, like, you know, group policy, we've got MFA. You find that most organizations haven't actually got MFA everywhere. There are accounts lurking around that are highly privileged that don't have MFA. Now, I guarantee most organizations, and it is actually considered good practice, will have a break glass account somewhere where you have a global admin account and it has a very strong password and the piece of paper with the password on 
and the user account gets locked in a safe somewhere and it's like, right, if all the admins die suddenly, which in an evil supervillain organisation is quite likely because I might just on a whim throw all of the admins into a tank full of sharks just because they've pissed me off this day, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what you do when you're evil. Um, if that happens, the problem you've got is that you have no access. So what I suggest is that you look at um, a security key and securing an account with that. And I actually have got exactly one of those. So if there's a volunteer with a laptop who'd like to step forward, we can log in as global admin. Do I try it? You, I would like yeah, you to try it. Yeah, it's worth a try. Now, I just realized that you're possibly being a bit of a dupe because I have just told you I'm an evil supervillain and you're taking a USB key from me, so you're trusting me a lot here. So, yeah, well, if I get in trouble by my boss, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, comparable deniability. I mean, none of that's my real name. It's an assumed identity. You know, I'm wearing a mask and I'll peel it off when I walk out here. So what I'd like you to do is go to the um, Microsoft admin portal. So just Google uh, or Bing that. I don't have actually have access to any Wi-Fi here. Oh, okay. There's Wi-Fi there. Oh, okay. Wi-Fi access. So there. if you want to do that whilst I just talk. Yeah. So what he's going to do is he's basically going to, this is the break glass account. So we've gone to the safe and we've smashed the glass and we've found this, this is our salvation. Now we're global admin and we can get our users back up and running whilst the um, last two admins finally give their last gasping, dying <laughs> deaths in the pit full of sharks or whatever it is and say, I wish I hadn't applied that update. There you go. Right. So if you just, and if you just go to, well, anywhere on the, anywhere that requires a Microsoft login, but if you just say Microsoft 365 admin portal, that's a good place to start. So I'm putting you under pressure here. I've pulled you out of the audience. I know, I, I haven't got connected to the Wi-Fi yet. Oh, it's all right. That was there another part of my evil plan. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so portal.office.com. Yeah, something like that. So you will find it's asking you to sign in. So um, I wonder if you can share your screen. Is this, are we going to go for a you radical use? shit here? Mm -hmm. um, on there. It's got a USB-C on here. This yeah. might just work. Yeah. Go. Okay, right. So it says, so go to sign in options. So it's going to say sign in with a security key. So click on that. And here is a security key. Now, the only thing about that, it'll go either way. It's, I'm not going to make a joke about that. So, <laughs> yeah. um, and it should have, if you've got it the right way up, it will acknowledge it. Right way up. And it's now going to ask for a pin. And I'm going to whisper you my pin. Okay. I'll change it afterwards. Okay. And actually, just watch out for your car. It might have a bomb underneath. <laughs> <laughs> but my pin is 196808. 196808 in this case. Okay, so 196808. That doesn't have all your is it? No. So it says touch the security key. Just to prove that you're not somebody, you know, that you're not doing this remotely. So it's asking you to log into that account there, so just click on that one. I'm just going to say no to that, you know? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, like I said, the bomb will take care of all that anyway. Your laptop will be <laughs> So there you are. Um, you know, and your harpoon owner's manual, my aims for 2020, missile launch codes. You know, it's all that. <laughs> so there you are, the keys to the kingdom. So, there you go. Yeah, so you didn't know anything, and literally there was no password exchanged anywhere like that. That piece of hardware allows you to log in. Now, obviously, that login session will persist, and so I will have to clear all my MFA sessions after that, but you get the idea. So basically, you can secure stuff without the idea of having these. Cause the phone authenticator is great, but it doesn't really work for break glass accounts. And for admin accounts, I actually think it's better to have something like this where you have physical custody of it. Now, now we're going back to the office, this is better. It didn't work so well when you were working from home, but the idea is the admin account is something you have around your neck. I think it's quite a good idea. And if somebody loses that, if I get drunk in a pub and leave that on the trip, get drunk in the pub quiz or whatever and leave that on the table, without the pin, it's not much use. So, okay, well, thank you, you for that. You can have that back. Thank you very much. There is. Keep the Simon session going. <laughs> 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 that would all. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you are suggesting the break glass account should have something like a phone key. I think it's a really good idea because it means that you're not a password is guessable in the end. 
that account belongs to this physical item. So, you know, I can keep this secured, I can put it in a safe, you know, with laser beams and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> and so unless Tom we Cruise comes a call in. Say it's like, put a conditional access policy in so it can only be accessed from a different IP address or something like that. Yeah, you can, but when you're an evil supervillain, you know, you want to be able to work from anywhere. You know, evil can <laughs> happen anywhere, you, you, you know. Um, obviously, conditional access policies are useful as well, but I'm just suggesting that you can actually have a physical token which makes it very, very secure indeed. So let's just get this back full screen. No matter how you prepare for these things, they always the AV is always bloody different in every place you go to. So let me just skip along. This was something that was much easier verti in the virtual world, wasn't it? Because you could have OBS set up and multiple screens and it all worked. So anyway, we've done the keys to the kingdom. So I'd just like to talk about auditing. We haven't got a great deal of time to talk about auditing. There's two approaches to auditing. One of them says attacks take place over a very long time. And so sometimes the people that are breaking in leave traces. And you're going to see those traces before you get there. The other attitude says, well, sometimes attacks can be really quite quick. And all you're going to do is find out who burgled you ha your house. And it's like, it's great to know how somebody got into your house, but they've still gone into your house. So you obviously there's a balance between auditing. Sometimes you can detect an attack before they're finally finished on some sophisticated long-term attacks. And sometimes it's, if it's a smash and grab, it's too late. You know, the auditing break, but it doesn't tell you much after it's happened. So let's just keep it moving at this point. So I'm going to talk about retention policies. Now, in this particular case, we just haven't got enough time to go into retention policies. You've all seen retention policies. My only word on retention policies is do not, like I did for a customer, name them after the amount of time the retention policies to last for. Um, <laughs> What you need to do is think about the information you've got and name your retention policies after what they are. If it's an HR document to do with a termination interview, it should be categorised as such. If you call it retain for seven years and the legislation changes, you've got these items tagged with something that's just patently wrong and what will happen is people will lump things together with the same retention policy. So with your retention policies, you need to think very carefully about giving them accurate names that reflect what it is and think about all the different types of documents because the law may change and if you give them names of times people will put an attention po retention policy on something that simply applies to the current legislation when things move it's just going to be chaos so suddenly you know the UK is going to get rid of GDPR so suddenly we'll have our own completely different data regulations or none whatsoever still to be decided then your retention policies that are all based on GDPR norms go out the window and you've applied these things and they last for a very very long time so your mistakes are going to haunt you for a very very long time so I just wanted to show you the information governance section we haven't really got time to drill into that in a huge detail and like I said, in this particular case, I don't think we've got time here. I'm just aware of how quickly time goes when you're talking here. I could show you labels, but I think the main thing to take away from labels, labels are actually really useful because you remember how I told you, if you don't have it, you can't lose it. So if you've got information that you don't need to retain, things like people that have applied for a job with you and then gone, because that information is personally identifiable information, or in my particular case, if we have X employees that I've had executed, I don't actually want to keep their details over the long time. I want to put a policy on there so after so many years that information gets deleted. In my actual demo, I have various people that work for me and I've showed the retention policy that after two years we would delete this information because they're dead or you know, whatever. So we don't really need to know. But just think very carefully about your retention policies and designing them to keep the information for the right amount of time that's appropriate. Because if you, if you delete information, that information is no longer a threat to you. Obviously, if it's something that you have to for legal compliance, then it's not so good. But just think very carefully about deleting information. All that information is not necessarily useful. Some of it is a threat. So I'm just going to skip this. So let's talk about sensitivity. So sensitivity labels are actually really, really interesting. Um, what I find interesting about sensitivity labels is sensitivity labels originally started in the SharePoint world and they've gradually spread out across the whole of 
Microsoft 365, so you can apply them to Teams, you can even, it's even starting to get into Azure and Power BI, so it's gradually spreading out, so it's a, a universal solution. And what's nice about them is most things, when you label something in the SharePoint world, you have a file and you have a piece of metadata, don't you? So a file has a life of its own and then you have metadata. And things like retention labels, the label is metadata that lives on separately to the file. Now the interesting thing about retention labels is you can actually encrypt the file and that file is stamped with some information and that is actually belonging to the file. So even if the file gets downloaded, the file gets forwarded through email, it gets passed around in Teams, whatever happens to that file, that information lives on with that file. So basically the, the retention policy, the, sorry, the uh, sensitivity policy actually lives on outside that file. So there's some really, really practical examples. I'm gonna just go into a little demo. I think we've got enough time to just go into this. One of the things you can do with it is you can stamp an email so that it can't be forwarded. Simple as that. So you can say, this piece of email, we can't forward it. So let me just bring that up. Oh, this screen is doing my head in because the screen is not below there. You know how it's hand to eye thing. Um, Come on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's just bring that up. So in this particular case here, I've got an email message. So I'm going to create a new email. Just drag this off. Don't need that 45 minutes. This shows you how long it's been since I last did a talk because I tried to update my software for the clicker and it just crashed because the clicker had just given up and it just didn't love me anymore. So um, if I just bring this onto the screen, I'm going to create an email message here from my evil tenant. And if you see here, there's sensitivity labels. I've created some sensitivity labels. I've got one here called For Your Eyes Only. And I'm just going to give it a subject, and I can say, I don't know, missile, missile launch or something like that. So here it goes, and I'm going to type something here. If I was a good typist, I'd type something interesting. So here's my message, and I'm going to send it to another account. It's so hard to type and talk at the same time. I'm just not clever enough to do both of them. So I'll just send this off. And hopefully, I'll just slide out look in. Or I will when my brain works out where my mouse has gone. It goes around that side and it it's the two are not next to each other in a rational way, you see. So here we go. So I've just sent myself missile launch stuff. So what it's saying is this has got some restricted permissions on here. So if I click open on this one, it's opened on the other screen. Nice one. Right. So you can see here, do not forward. So recipients can't forward but I can grant permission specifically to this, so you can limit what can happen. So you, I could limit this so it can't be forwarded, I limit this so it can be forwarded in different ways. So you can actually embed within that email something to say whether it can and can't be forwarded. And if you notice here, it's got a do not forward. Now, interestingly enough, because this is a demo, the forward UI is still showing as forwarding, which is interesting, because that should be grayed out. It was grayed out when I tested it earlier, but I've just clicked and it's not responding to forward, but interestingly enough, the UI is not showing that grayed out. Now, I'm sure when I tried this earlier, it was grayed out, but if you notice, I keep hitting forward, and it ain't forwarding. So, there's some things you can do here. So, obviously, you can protect documents in a lot more detail as well. There's all that sort of stuff. It's quite easy to do, but I'm acutely aware that we're short of time. So, what I'm just gonna do is I'm going to come back to my original slide deck, and I'm going to Oh, come on, I should be able to use a mouse at the same time. So, we just showed labels. So we've done that, done the information protection. 
Um, I do have a link there. If you want to try that, that is a OneDrive link. And on there, it links to a folder in OneDrive. And one of the documents is locked down, and one of the documents isn't. If you try and open that document, it'll say who you are. It'll ask you to authenticate. If you can't authenticate as me, which hopefully you shouldn't be able to, then you can't see the document. So literally, I've shown you how to leak an information. Now, you've got special powers beyond this. So all I can say is watch out for people, you know, People with large teeth, or you know, ninjas, or something else on the way home. You know, you could have a nasty accident. I, I really would check the brakes on your car as well. <laughs> um, don't go driving along any mountain passes late at night for the next few days. During my weekends. <laughs> oh, okay. and there you go, living on the mountain as well. Okay. So, um, hopefully, we've all got that. I'd like to just sum up here. So, my messages are: authenticate, MFA all the things, audit is possibly a way of not getting fooled again, but it may or may not help you. Destroy, just destroy stuff you don't need. That's the key takeaway from this, is don't keep it if you don't sodding well need it. <laughs> and then lastly, loose lips sink ships. So, and my slogan for the end is just to say, for evil to triumph, does it just need to implement good security measures? Because if you think about all these films, what happens? Star Wars. How different would Star Wars have been if they just applied sensitivity labels to the Death Star plans? It would have been a very different film. <laughs> it would have been a completely different film. There would have only ever been one Star Wars film, and it would have been a complete rout. The Empire would have won very, very easily because those pesky rebels would have just shot up the Death Star, nothing would have happened, they'd have brushed themselves off and carried on. You know, it'd have been a very, very different film. Most spy films would be very different if they just implemented some good data security. So there we go, Galactic Empire, and they still can't get the basic stuff right. So um, I'd like to thank you all for coming along. I'm sorry it was short. I really would like to talk for longer, but I just wanted to have a little bit of fun and just impart some ideas on you. Of There are actually simple things you can do, not just if you're evil and you're trying to take over the world, but if you're just trying to make your enterprise just that little bit more secure. So thank you, everybody. Yeah.